Republican people never have shutdowns. And yet we find ourselves in the grip of another federal government shutdown. And you think we would have learned by now, I mean, children's health insurance not happening? Like, gee, is that too important to trust to the federal government? I would think so. And while America is asking whose fault is this, and they're trying to debate in hashtags, is it the Trump shutdown or the Schumer shutdown? And I have to say, I've been watching uh, way too much C-SPAN recently, and it, it's really pretty disgusting to see this petty blame game to hear Republicans saying it's all Democrats' fault, and they're a bunch of evil, wicked liars, and for Democrats to say the same thing about Republicans, and for once, I have to say, they're both right. Now, if you're confused about this, looking at the shutdown, I mean, you can play this both ways. You can say, well, the Democrats are responsible for the immediate shutdown because of the filibuster in the Senate, or the Republicans are responsible because they created the situation and have created all the CRs going for the funding, the, the, the continuing resolutions and temporary spending measures and all of that. But if you're trying to understand this by listening to people on Capitol Hill, you're bound to be confused because you're listening to liars. And the thing about liars is you can't trust them. And for people who have any sense of integrity or care about the truth, they simply don't have any credibility. Speaking of which, Senator Schumer, I got to hear on television say, nobody wants to shut down. Mr. Schumer, I can say decisively that is absolutely not true. People who care about freedom want the federal government shut down forever, but not like this. Not in this kind of chaotic, disruptive manner that we can count on from the Democrats and the Republicans. No. People who care about freedom want to see a peaceful, orderly, responsible dissolution of the entire federal government, and that's why they're supporting Kokesh for president. I also got to see Nancy Pelosi in a press conference today, and I have to congratulate her for not having one of her uh, really, really embarrassing senior moments, but there was a particularly interesting part of her speech where she kept going off on C words. It's the C word, and you know, compassion or lack thereof, and you know, uh, consistency and lack thereof on, on part of the Republicans. But I was just thinking, Nancy, 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 the last thing you want to say to get people thinking the wrong thing when you're talking to them is to get them to think of the C word. Now, why is this really happening? Mainly because America hasn't woken up and started electing libertarians yet, but it's because we have all of these narcissistic sociopaths on Capitol Hill who simply weren't loved enough as children and are desperate for this attention. I mean, look at it. We're giving them exactly what they want. They throw a tantrum, they shut things down, and everybody starts looking to Capitol Hill. And there's all the grandstanding and moralizing and posturing. But really, the answer is to take all of those people, you know, lock them up in institutions and, you know, pat them on the head consistently and say, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, we love you, we love you, and get them the therapy that they need. Now, incidentally, the last time the federal government shut down was in 2013. And I happened to be in jail that time, too, and from the correctional facility in Washington, D.C., I got to watch that government shut down unfold on the front page of the Washington Post. But I think things are different this time. I think the American people have realized that the issues that are happening, uh, the, the issues that are being debated on Capitol Hill, the way that this is affecting the American people, is just, they're fed up. I, I, I don't, I, I really, from what I've been able to see, I've been listening to people calling in the C-SPAN. I know that's not the best sample of American public opinion. Um, and by the way, Steve, man, you have a Republican line and a Democrat line, but you don't have a Libertarian line. No wonder this country is so screwed up. Um, because obviously, if there were Libertarians on Capitol Hill, this wouldn't have happened. It's clear that if anybody's fault, this is not, it's the Libertarians. And I think there has been a fundamental shift. I think the American people are actually looking at this government shutdown fundamentally differently than they did in 2013. That's because enough of us have realized that we are too good for this government. And you're listening to Adam vs. the Man. Today is Sunday, January 21st, 2018. I'm coming at you from the Kokesh presidential suite that is cell D32 in the
the Wise County Correctional Facility, and I am so grateful that so many of you are listening to me right now that I'm able to reach people through this medium while locked up, that we have this means of accountability for criminals and government who have falsely arrested and imprisoned me, who are, who are holding me hostage for ransom here. And I'm so grateful to have an amazing team behind me that makes it possible to to take this stand. And, and I, want, I want people to understand uh, what I'm doing, and we've kept some of this under wraps until now for strategic reasons legally, but it's important now for you to understand as I'm ready to ask you for a specific favor. You have one minute remaining on your call. Sorry for the interruption. Podcasting from jail is fun, but it's also challenging, obviously. So, as I was saying, what I'm doing here is taking a stand for a lot of specific reasons in terms of the legal challenges that we're facing. And up until this point, we haven't been able to, to publicly disclose all of that because of some of the strategy involved here. But if you saw the videos of, uh, leading up to my arrest from my Facebook Live, uh, if you have been following the legal circumstances here, if you listen to my last podcast, you know, I was... Uh, I haven't been presented with any official charging documents, even when, I, when I've requested them multiple times. Um, there, there have been a lot of problems with the unlawful search. There are a lot of other issues here. Obviously, there's the fact that there is no crime here because any alleged crime uh, that they have accused me of is victimless. But to get to the heart of the matter and what we're, we're going for here, because I am, this is time for me to finally ask you guys for a big favor. And, and I want to explain why why this is so important. Obviously, this is, like I said, this is a great test case already. And if I had just bonded out, and I could have bonded out on Wednesday and said, I'm out of here, let's give the, let's give the bonds the $6,000 and give a bunch of money to the government, then you know I could have gotten out of here. But we would not be in the position that we're in right now to make this particular play and push this particular issue. So first of all, I am a member of the Oklahoma Native American Church. And as some of you know who caught me on uh, our last tour, uh, I have a card. I'm actually a card-carrying member, and the card explains how under federal law, uh, well established by precedent, as well as, by the way, state law in Texas, under religious freedom, I am allowed to possess uh, marijuana, those like mushrooms, uh, I think it says ayahuasca, and uh, it lists a few other substances and things like that, but it says, but not limited to as uh, church sacraments. And so everything that I am being accused of was legal for me at the time. And what you didn't see in those videos, as soon as the cop required me to turn off my camera, uh, I, he, he came up and asked me some questions. He said, is there any, you know, is there, are there any drugs in the vehicle? And I said, sir, in my wallet, you will find my membership card to the Oakland Way Native American Church. And there is no contraband in my vehicle. And he came, he, he said to me, I don't care what's in your wallet, and I don't care what's in your RV, you're getting arrested today. And I was, I was just like, well, I, I, I could kind of tell from the way you were approaching this traffic stop from the beginning that that was the case. But... What we're asking you to do now is to participate in this call flood Monday morning to the DA and to the judge involved in this case because my attorney, um, he is going to be submitting a writ of habeas corpus if he has not done this already. And by the way, there is an outside chance that later today, maybe when this podcast is released, that they'll come to their senses and, and grant this writ and release me and we won't even have to do this call flood, but I think that's pretty unlikely. Um, either way, be ready to make this, these calls starting at 9 a.m. on uh, Texas time on Monday. And it's the writ of habeas corpus is to uh, agree to not prosecute on any of these charges, although I have, to, I have to apologize, partly because I don't have all of the paperwork to which I am legally entitled to here, that I don't know exactly what the circumstances are in terms of the case. They don't have a case number. They haven't indicted me. Charges haven't been brought and they don't have any paperwork on it. So it has to be a writ of habeas corpus challenging the grounds for detaining me based on these charges, however they're legally filed at this point. So this is the time for action, and I really appreciate everybody 
standing by me. So wherever you're hearing me talking about this now, whether it's in a video or podcast form, if you go to the description, you'll see the details about when and what numbers to call and, and what we would like you to say. Um, and I got to say, shout out to Ben Farmer, my awesome chief strategist, who is going to be putting that post together, explaining that, you know all of the details about this call flood and getting their numbers on that. So, you know, I, one of the reasons that this is happening, obviously, if, 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 you know, if you look at what happened on Tuesday, which was the day that I announced the presidential campaign, it is possible that everything was a coincidence, that I was pulled over and pulled over again 40 minutes later, and that I just happened to run into a, a really wicked cop who was just determined to send me to jail, regardless of, of whether I committed any crimes. And you can look at it that way and be like, well, yeah, it's, a, it's possible, it's just a coincidence, but, you know, that, that's a real stretch, obviously. But I'm not doing this really for anything having to do with the presidential campaign. I've been presented with an opportunity, and most people who go through a situation like this, as, as I noticed at the little unofficial arraignment we had here, which I'll explain in a minute, uh, most of the people who are in jail here are for petty drug crimes. And it, it's really, really sad. And, and a lot of them fall for the shakedown racket that is the bond system in Wise County. And they pay out because they can't afford to take time off of work. They're going to lose their jobs if they do a few nights in jail. They can't be away from their families. Well, you know, I'm, I'm in a position where I have a great team of people behind me. I have the, the flexibility. You know, I can take the stand. I can, I can hire an attorney and I can fight this properly. And I'm doing this for all of those people who would be victims of the drug war, who, uh, you know, who aren't in a position to fight it this way and, and, and aren't in a position to bring any kind of, uh, you know, attention to their tragedies. But because I'm in this position, I feel like I have to fight it in order to make sure that there are less victims of the drug war in this way. And while I cannot tell anybody publicly yet, exactly what our plans are for when this shakes out. Obviously, no matter what the outcome, we're going to be in a great position to do some amazing things around these issues. There are definitely going to be some lawsuits around false arrests and false imprisonment and all sorts of other stuff following up on this. But we have to make this play first, and we have to get me out of here uh, on, on the best terms possible first. So um, about, about some of the... Uh, dynamics here in some of my experience because I know people have been wondering. First of all, I was locked up, uh, arrested by Texas State Patrol, and they were operating in Weiss County and dropped me off at the Weiss County facility. And by the way, I, I got to say, it was really awesome. Uh, night before last, I got a visit from Christopher Kelly, who I've always known as Staff Sergeant Kelly or Keister, and he was my Staff Sergeant in Iraq in 2004. We've been great friends. And now he moved out here from California because of the lower regulations, specifically in this county. And it makes me wonder if the people of Weiss County understand, as, as a freedom of people, just how screwed up their county government is in this regard in the shakedown racket. And I, I think that, you know, within the jail, all of the guards have been great, uh, with, with one exception. Um, and you know what? I... I was gonna, I was gonna out this guy, but I think, I think I'm gonna give him a pass at least for the time being. But yes, I was threatened with pepper spray for not taking my clothes off. Um, obviously, it didn't happen. I'm not telling you the story of how I got pepper spray, but uh, I lay down on the floor and said, "Really, you want me to take my clothes off that bad? Go ahead and pepper spray a man laying down." And uh, that did not happen. So uh, thank you, Keister, for visiting me here in jail. And I gotta say, it's really just. The Weiss County thing is, it, it really is a shakedown racket, what they do with the, the bond here. And I can, I can tell you this because, and I wish I got the woman's name, but we had a little arraignment here in the jail, and it was a very unofficial hearing. I specifically asked if it was a hearing on the record, and, and they said no. Um, I went and I, I demanded my documentation that I'm entitled to, the police report, and you know the charging documents, and I was denied them. And I said, I will not participate in the Wise County bond system because of the shakedown racket. And incidentally, the, the judge, they kept calling her the judge. She's not a judge. She's a justice of the peace. Doesn't even have to have a law degree. And they originally, she set my bail. 
my bond at eighty thousand dollars, which would have meant I would have had to put up six thousand and forfeit it. And we had my attorney again, awesome job, got the bond reduced from eighty thousand to twenty thousand, so I'd only have to put up you know, less than two thousand dollars. I'm still not going to do that uh, because I need to, to stay in here to take this stand. But and I don't want to pay off the state, obviously. But um, this this justice of the peace. She tried to quadruple charge me on the bond. And I have to wonder how many desperate young men and women who get in here who get locked up with bullshit drug war crimes are getting extorted by this woman. And of course it goes to pay for, you know, county law enforcement, blah, 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 blah. But to the people of Wise County, if you really are a freedom loving people, you can do better than this. You gotta pay some attention to the people who are being victimized in your county. And a lot of them are people who are just passing through like myself. So um, I, I did ask for some books when I got here, and it was funny because I have a, I have a TV in my jail cell, but I couldn't get any books. Uh, I, I did get a copy after a few days of The Purpose Driven Life and Mentor, The Kid and the CEO. I, I've enjoyed both of those. And just today, um, I guess now, five days after getting locked up, I was finally able to get a copy of the Bible. So thank you to, uh, to the guard who was able to get me that. I appreciate it very much. Not that I'm a... Uh, Bible literalist or anything like that, but uh, it definitely makes for a good read when the alternative is watching cable news and a bunch of I, 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 words fail to describe the disgust that I feel for Congress right now. So yes, um, I'm reading the Bible again, and one of one of the challenges here, you know, for me being in jail again, you know. For most people, not being in a position to go to jail, part of it is, you know, who they are and what they're capable of and ready for. Well, for me, after going to Iraq for seven months and sleeping in the dirt, you know, a few days in jail, a couple weeks, a few months, if that's what's required, not a big deal. And I got to let everybody know here, and of course, to the people who are listening in, that I'm prepared to sit around for months if, if that's what it takes to take this stand. If they really want to play hardball, if they really want to mess with the wrong Marines some more, then we're going to have fun. Do you want to dance? Let's dance, Wise County. But um, there are some things that have been some distinct challenges here that I will share with you. And one of them I am about to file a grievance about, which is their alarms. They have an alarm that, oh, can you hear it? There it goes. Holy crap, right on cue. <laughs> it's about every 20 minutes. There's an alarm that goes off here. Really, the timing was incredible. I wish I could say I planned that. Uh, <laughs> they have an alarm that goes off every 20 minutes, and it's kind of a cross between a school bell and a fire alarm. And the purpose is to alert the guards that it's time for them to make their rounds. Now, my cell is pretty close to the little command center where the alarm goes off, so maybe it's worse for me than for people in the rest of the facility. But I think it qualifies as cruel and inhumane treatment to put someone in a room where there's an alarm going off every 20 minutes. So sleep has been really challenging. I have enough problem with sleep as it is, but I don't think I've slept much more than 20 minutes straight. And, you know, the alarm goes off and I wake up and there's all sorts of other jail noise and stuff. So it's been, that's been really frustrating. And of course, sleeping on one of these super flimsy foam mattresses on a, on a steel bed isn't really pleasant either, and that's starting to get to my back. The other thing is the, the food. You know, on the outside, I eat very healthy. I'm used to eating about 90% fruits and vegetables. And in here, it's like 90% grains and animal products. And I've been in a lot of jails, and I have to say, Wise County, you can do better than this. This is about the worst jail food that I've ever had. And it hurts. Like, it hurts to eat. Like, I, I can't put down an entire tray of food without stopping. And, and by the end of it, I'm, I'm like forcing myself to eat because the food is that bad. Now, don't feel sorry for me. This is kind of a temporary situation. You have one minute remaining on your call. One minute left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The people you should be feeling sorry for are the inmates who they refer to as indigents who don't have any money on their commissary accounts who really don't have any option here, who are here for months eating this crap, and it's poisoning them. Corn syrup, all sorts of disgusting crap in it. But if I'm here for any extended period, I'll be able to get commissary on Tuesday. So the last little chat.
challenge of my time here so far that I'd like to share. And there have been plenty of other little things, but it was very cold when I got to my cell. And, and not that the cell itself was too cold altogether, but there was a cold air vent directly over the bunk. And I have some injuries. I have a lot of old joint injuries and stuff that are aggravated by the cold. And so I would be like in, in significant discomfort from like I, it, I either couldn't be in bed or, uh, you know, I would be in, in pain. And so I have, I have a, a really threadbare blanket. And, and what I mean by that is it, it's so thin that it, I, when I lift it up to my face, I can watch TV through it. And so I, I, I asked for another blanket. It's like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm this is, I'm not asking for any special privilege. I'm uncomfortable. You know, you don't have to change my cell temperature, whatever. But you know what? I just, can I get another blanket, please? I would really appreciate it. And what happened is the guard came in to my cell with a laser thermometer and pointed it at all the walls and the floor and said, I'm sorry, sir, but your jail cell is within regulation, so we can't give you another blanket. Now, I just have to point out the irony of this. I have a cable television in my cell. You have a thermometer with a laser built in to remotely check the temperature of a surface. And I'm asking for a $2 piece of crap blanket, and you can't give me one because of jail regulations. It's just it, it's mind-boggling, the insanity of this. But I, I've been... You know, laying in bed with my blanket on most of the day, watching crappy cable TV, eating terrible food. So, you know, I feel a lot like President Trump, and, and I, it's uh, it, it's nice to, to have that. It's just that I don't have uh, Twitter available. I guess that's, that's the main difference. Now, in my inmate handbook, rule number one is inmates will not violate any law defined as a felony or misdemeanor under the laws of the state of Texas. Now, I happen to know they've got some pretty silly laws here, so I wanted to be careful. I requested a copy of the entire Texas state criminal statute that would tell me everything that's a felony or misdemeanor under the laws of the state of Texas, mainly because I wanted the writing material, you know. I mean, of course, it'd be nice to be able to follow all of the rules if that were possible, but I don't have enough paper here to write right now. So to have just a big stack of papers to be able to write on the back would have been really appreciated. But one of the things, the other thing I want to share from the inmate handbook, or rather the specifically Wise County Jail Inmate Rules and Regulations number 34, all indigent inmates will be supplied enough stamps and writing material to mail three personal letters per week upon request. A reasonable amount of writing material will be provided for corresponding with the following, letters to the inmate's attorney of record, letters to bona fide news media, don't be sending letters to any news media that's not bona fide or that might be against the jail rules, uh, state officials and officers, including the Texas Commission on Jail Standards and Governor, officials of federal, state, and local courts, and finally, all federal officials and officers, including the President of the United States. So while it won't be until Tuesday when I get some stamps with my commissary that I'll be able to send this one, but I sent, uh, I, excuse me, I wrote out uh, my letter to President Trump, Dear Mr. President, in 2020, you're fired. Sincerely, Adam Kokesh, Libertarian for President. Now, before I wrap this up, I, I have a bit of a segment a, bit, a segment that makes me a, a little bit uncomfortable, but it's been a change that I brought about in my life to have a higher standard of behavior for people around me, cutting out liars especially, cutting out people who are untrustworthy, low-integrity people, people who are haters, people who just engage in snaky behavior in general. And that brings us, of course, to cowardly little Larkin. That's right, Larkin Rose. Now, Larkin, did you really think you were going to be able to talk trash about me and spread rumors while I was in jail without me finding out about it? Really? You really thought you could get away with that? Now, I'm not surprised because Larkin has done stuff like this in the past, but I guess he only thought he could get away with it publicly now that I'm in jail. But no, sorry, Larkin, I've been read over the phone what you said. And basically you're saying, if da-da-da-da-da, then yuck, yuck on Adam. Ugh. Yeah, so 
So you're you're basically looking for an excuse to be a hater. And you're saying, well, if this is true, if this is true, if this is true, then shame on Adam. Which is just so you know, Lark, and it would be like, what, what you said about me would be the equivalent of me saying, well, if Larkin eats babies, he really needs to stop. Well, if, if Larkin is abducting children, he really needs to stop. Well, if Larkin is, is ripping off old ladies, then, then yuck. Yuck on him. Shame on Larkin. And, and this is Larkin. I mean, you're looking for an excuse to be a hater. And that's really pathetic. It's really just, it is petty and sad. And I'm, I'm frankly not surprised. And, you know, I put up with a lot of crap from you over the years, but I'm done with it. I'm calling you out, and this is it. Because every time you've interacted with me personally off the record, even though I've interviewed you multiple times for my various productions, you've been petty and demeaning and, and just rude. And, and now, that's why I say little. But you're also cowardly, because you would pull something like this while I'm in jail is only one reason. But the real reason I think that Larkin is such a coward intellectually is because he not only doesn't properly apply or understand the non-aggression principle, because he has asserted that voting is violence. Obviously, voting is not violence. If you say that voting is violence, you don't understand the non-aggression principle. But I've challenged him on this before. I've challenged him to a debate numerous times, even in Anarchapulco, and he's declined. In fact, instead of debating me at Anarchapulco this year, he's going to be debating Lauren Southern, who I've already debated on the topic that they're debating. So Larkin, yeah, enjoy the, the weak, sloppy seconds of that. She's already been destroyed on this issue, and yet that's what you'd rather do. You'd rather run away from a real challenge. So, you know, this is just... I. I I'm I'm just I'm I'm disgusted because you would do something like this and send your petty army of trolls against me and th that you would try to pull this while I'm in jail considering you've gone to jail as an activist yourself is really just sick and sad. So I you know I I don't know what else to say about this Larkin, but I am I am frankly disgusted in your behavior and I'm done with it. So I guess that's all I have to say about that. Uh, but, you know, there are, there are a few other call-outs that I've got in the works for people in our movement who have been similarly shady. Now, I don't think Larkin is COINTELPRO. Uh, I just think he's a petty, cowardly person. But if you saw the video that I released today on uh, Steemit and DTube and YouTube and Vimeo, it was my speech from earlier this year, last year, at the Free Your Mind conference about COINTELPRO. And for the people who are in this movement and are always taking down other activists who are, who are being petty and, and demeaning and hurting other people, instead of being positive and celebrating and lifting up our fellow freedom activists, you know, it doesn't matter if they're COINTELPRO or not. We have to kick these people out of our lives. I don't want to say out of the movement or oppose any sort of collectivism here, but for the liars and the snakes and the petty people and, and the ones who just are, 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 you know, pull shit like this, I think it's really important that we have for ourselves as libertarians, as voluntarists, uh, a higher standard of integrity. And for all the people who I have tolerated in the past, who I've uh, let be around me as liars and, and, and petty people, I apologize that I haven't in the past done a better job of protecting the movement from them. So this is a part of, of you know, a, a new, uh, new approach for me of being direct and assertive because this has been happening for so long. There have been so many other activists, and Larkinus is the first that I'm seeing with this like absolutely decisive bullshit to call out like this. But for you know me, I've been a full-time activist for uh, geez, uh, within in a month or two now, it'll be 11 years. You know, I've had people sniping at me, and I just kind of let it go, and not anymore. Uh, I'm not going to put up with that. So finally. There has been a national mainstream media blackout on my story since Tuesday. You would think a libertarian presidential candidate gets arrested in shady circumstances, that the national media would be all over it. But no, they would rather cover pedo bill wealth and make sure that the American people know that we're represented by a you know Hillary-loving big government Massachusetts Republican. And obviously, a big part of this campaign is taking back the Libertarian Party from the establishment and putting it back in the hands of Libertarians. So I hope you'll join me in that. 
and get involved at togasforpresident.com. Sign up to be a delegate, help us out with what we have planned for the 2018 convention to take back the Libertarian Party. Now, because there's been a mainstream media national blackout of this story, uh, I want to call on the international media. And I got to say, our media coordinator for the campaign, Marcus, has just been doing an awesome job. Thank you so much, Marcus. And it's great to know that we're not just saying, hey, the mainstream media is, you know, hasn't covered this story. They are actually getting press releases about this and choosing not to cover it. Again, this is why this country is so messed up. So for all the foreign media that uh, you know, might hear this, I, I just want to say, while you're covering the shutdown, don't forget that the shutdown would not be happening without the systematic suppression of libertarians in America, including the taking of political prisoners such as myself. So for all of you who are helping get this out to the media, to a wider audience, thank you so much. And I would hope, I don't think they've covered this yet, although obviously I can't check online myself, um, but at least uh, Cody, who's helping produce this podcast right now from California over the phone, was unaware of any production or any coverage of this story from Russia Today, my old employer, excuse me, I guess, I guess they weren't really an employer, my old uh, network, my old TV network, Russia Today, if you would cover this, I would greatly appreciate it. This is a great chance to be the finger in the eye of the American government that I once enjoyed being a part of as part of your network. So thank you so much to everybody for listening to this. Uh, Cody, did I forget anything? Um... You wanted to maybe mention the Bitcoin transaction? Oh, well, I guess there's a blog post about that. And yeah, apparently I was the first person to make a Bitcoin transaction from jail. But I'm sure that there's been someone else with a cell phone in jail who has pulled this off before. But I was able to pull it off legally. I was in the middle of a local Bitcoin transaction when I got rolled up. And uh, with a little finagling with the guard, I was able to get access to my cell phone and complete the transaction. Uh, so that was that was a, a fun little sub story about that. But anyway, that's it. Thanks for helping produce this, Cody. Really appreciate it. Thanks to everybody who's listening. Thanks to everybody who's been helping out since I've been locked up and for taking this stand with me. So peace, love, and freedom. If you want to join the fight, join us at thefreedomline.com. Cool, huh?